Well, good day there. This is Joe Van Cleve, and hey, welcome to today where we're going to review the results from typing assignment number seven. Stay tuned. I think for many of us, this was a rather difficult assignment, which was to uh, write about a major obstacle in your life, a mountain figuratively or literally that you've had to tackle or climb. It's difficult for a lot of us, I think, because uh, it requires a lot of introspection. And also, uh, perhaps you've never really been a, a cognizant of the mountain in your life. Maybe you're still struggling to climb it. So everybody's in a different place in that regard. And so I know it was difficult to, uh, to do uh, real justice to the topic. But you know what? You guys came through really well. We had a total of 13 participants. And I was really pleased to see that and was really gratified to see the quality of work that resulted. So without any further ado, let's get into the slideshow and then I'll talk a little bit about my reflections on your work.
So Andrew Nichols' piece titled A Great Achievement in My Life was written on a 1950s Hermes baby. And this is a really fun piece. So he uh, revisits uh, poetry. So he, in his formative years, was an avid poet, and then he gravitated to uh, a life of really enjoying music for many years. And then finally, later in life, he finds, he revisits or rediscovers his love of poetry, and he finds his mature poet's voice. And uh, he enters a contest, a poetry contest, and it, this is a poetry slam, which if you're not familiar with this, it's, it's, it's about... Sort of, the, sort of a spoken word performance. And he was very nervous uh, about it, of course, uh, but his partner helped him through his nervousness and gave him a lot of confidence. And after, uh, after the slam, after the contest, the host of the event, who, which is poet Mark Grist, encouraged him that he was, quote, doing poetry few others were doing, unquote. And that encouragement inspired him to move his writing and performance forward. So his mountain that he overcame was obviously public speaking. He was very nervous about it at first, but later on he, he found his place, he found his voice. And I really was heartened by this story, especially because... In my uh, younger, early adult years, I was a fledgling poet, and I haven't really revisited my poetry either. So your piece, Andrew, gives me some inspiration and hope maybe I should revisit that. But thanks a lot. It was a great piece. I loved it. Okay, the next piece was by David Randall. It was written on an Olivetti Studio 44, and it was titled Climb the Mountain. And uh, so this is about um, David being... Uh, having enjoyed a, a long and successful career in the banking industry. And as a result of a corporate merger, he is laid off. He finds himself shockingly unemployed after uh, having done the one thing in life that he was professionally qualified to do, and that was taken out from underneath him. He was no longer a banker. And so uh, he went through quite a bit of struggle to uh, piece together his life, what he was going to do. But a former colleague suggested perhaps he should get into some computer-oriented job because during his career in the banking industry, he had been involved early on in computerizing spreadsheet analysis. And so uh, David, in, the, in, his 19, in his 40s, he ended up going back to school. And, and this is a really inspiring story. And for two years. And so it wasn't paid for by any uh, grant or anything else. He had to pay for it out of his own pocket. And he bicycled to school. He became pretty physically fit as a result. It was a real struggle, right, going to school and working and all that. So he started his own business, helping other small businesses, right, based on his knowledge from the banking industry. And now he finds himself, years later, employed uh, by a major retailer and having a really nice career. But what's great about this is he knows that if something happens in the future and he gets knocked down, he knows how to get back up again because he's done it before this experience has given him a lot of confidence and so this was really an inspiring read i really enjoyed it it gives me confidence and it sounds like it would give other people confidence that if you can do it i can do it so it was a great story i loved it david thank you so diane cox's piece was written on a hermes 3000 and it was about to climb the highest mountain and so uh there's a lot of other stories that are possible in what she, she's written because her and her husband have a history of going on adventurous motorcycle journeys, cross-country journeys of various types. They've been to Burning Man and all this. Um, so this particular journey that she writes about was a long trip from Houston, Texas area to New Mexico, and they drove and visited the Carlsbad Caverns, they went to Roswell, and there is a really interesting uh, UFO story in this, in this uh, accounting of it where they saw something mysterious on, in the sky and, and there was a cow nearby and they weren't sure if it was gonna be a, you know, one of these cattle abduction mutilation thingies. That was very funny. But they went up to Santa Fe and they visited the Loretta Chapel which was, has the miraculous staircase and her husband is a woodworker and really appreciates the craftsmanship that went into this. But, um, and then there was a fun bathroom story relating to this uh, also. But the, the meat of the story is when they get to Colorado Spring, Springs and they're going to 
ride their bikes up to the top of Pikes Peak, which is a 14,000 foot mountain. And at the time, a few years ago, when they made this trip, the uh, road up to Pikes Peak was mostly a dirt road toward the top. And it's uh, many miles. In fact, it was 13 miles of just dirt roads. But her motorcycle is loaded down with all her camping equipment and supplies. So it's, it's really ungainly and top heavy and not as uh, as nimble as you might have liked and so it you know this road if you ever seen videos of pikes peak hill climb it's very steep and no guardrails and thousand foot drop-offs so a very nerve-wracking trip to the top of the mountain for her and she was really nervous when she got to the top but the ride down is even more nerve-wracking. Now, I can really appreciate this because a few years ago we uh, went to Pikes Peak and I decided I wasn't going to risk ruining the brakes on my car. And I, we took the, uh, the tram uh, up to the mountain instead of you know, wearing out our car's brakes. I can really appreciate this as being a motorcyclist also. The, with not as much nerve as you have though. But, and here's the fun part about her story. On the trip home, they stopped through Albuquerque, my hometown, and at a coffee shop, and she says, but no one was typing. Alas, where was I? I should have been there, Diane. Sorry I missed you. Anyway, this was a really fun story, and I can really appreciate all the adventure involved. And You know, you have other adventures to write about. I'd like to hear about your Burning Man story. <laughs> but anyways, it was well done, Diane. Thank you. So the next piece is David Wells, and he wrote this on a 1957 Olympia SM3 in senatorial typeface. I'm glad you informed us of that. That was very cool. So um, his mountain that he has to tackle in this story is a pile of dirty dishes. Now that sounds rather mundane, but really what this is about is about self-sufficiency. His dishwasher broke. Anybody who is a homeowner has had to deal with these kind of issues knows that this can be very uh, troubling to your peace and quiet, and especially if you don't either don't have the resources to pay for a new dishwasher or pay for a repair, and you want to do it yourself, it can be very challenging. Well, he met the challenge head on, and I love the way he described it. So he found an old donor machine, an old used dishwasher that had a good motor, a, a reasonably good motor, and he was able to replace the motor out of his old dishwasher with the one from the loaner machine or the donor machine. And it's a great story of personal satisfaction that you experience in repairing something via buying a new one. And um, it really is an encouraging piece. This really encourages me, and it seems like it would encourage a lot of other people, to learn to be self-sufficient. Don't uh, react to your initial uh, sense of fear about, will I be able to do this? Ignore the fear. Just jump in it and look at it logically, analyze the problem, and figure out how to do it. And this whole ethic described in his story is kind of mirrored by the idea, by the fact that what he wrote this story on, this Olympia SM3, was a new machine he had just gotten, and he hadn't even had a chance to fix it up. He just put a new ribbon on it and was actually having to fix problems in the machine as he was writing the story. So there is a kind of a... Uh, breaking through the fourth wall, if you will, <laughs> in the moral of this story. So, David, I really enjoyed your piece. Well done. And David Cornelius' piece, uh, Climb the Highest Mountain, was typed on an Olympia SF in, uh, is it italics or script? It looks like a script font. But uh, this is a real poignant accounting of his transition from a career in the U.S. Air Force to the civilian world and finding himself so out of place in his first job, which was working at a call center, customer support. And it was just a bad fit for him in terms of what he did professionally in the Air Force. Um, but he eventually finds a career as a program analyst for the Pentagon, for, the, for the, some military programs, and now he has a rewarding career and, and he can see some of the fruit of his labor as new military capabilities are out in the field and a great sense of satisfaction. So this was a great story. I really like to see the idea of a person who spent time in the military can use that skill uh, in, in a civilian career afterwards. Very good. I really loved it, David. Well done. 
Andy Kev's piece was written on a 1954 Smith Corona silent, and uh, it's interesting. Um, he, this was really serious and personal, and I really appreciate all of the um, effort it took and the courage it took to talk about this. But Andy is an identical twin, and his struggle really it's the struggle of his of his of his brother is something that most of us who are not identical twins don't appreciate which is the challenge of as he says seek out a separateness and an individuality from his sibling that has always been the challenge of growing up as an identical twin is everything, the birthdays and the, all the accomplishments in life and all the stages of growing up. It was always a comparison between him and his sibling or everything was done together. There was never any sense of, of a, of a um, individual recognition of him as a person or his brother as a unique person. It was always the context of the twins. I can really see that and you really describe this so well, Andy. Uh, it really makes me understand this better how resentments can build up over the years of being identified as a plurality rather than as an individual. And the real challenge for Andy personally was overcoming his own mountain of resentment toward his sibling brother, and which he has achieved. He's gotten that peace. But the, the sad thing about this is that his other, his sibling still has those resentments, uh, that mountain that separates him. So they don't yet enjoy that mutual relationship, but uh, hopefully in the future there'll be some progress. But I really thought this was a great, great personal accounting, and there's a lot of value in this, in the sense of uh, the way it was, it, it helps us to understand the dilemma of identical twins better. So the next piece was written by Dohang Michael Kitchen, and uh, this was an interesting piece about, um, so, Michael enters law school at age 36. So he's older than the average student, obviously. And he's working, he's working and going to school in an evening study program. Working full time and going to school in the evening. It's a grueling schedule. He did this for like five years or something. Um, and while he was in this work study thing, he also was co-writing the memoirs of a Detroit City Council President Emeritus, Irma Henderson. And so he has this other academic kind of project on the side. And what's great is that the book that he co-wrote was released at the same time that he graduated from law school. But now the mountain that he has to climb, he has to overcome in his life, is that he prepared several months for the bar exam. And he really worked hard at it. and his first time through, he did not succeed. He did not pass the bar exam. Then about maybe six months later or so, uh, he took the exam the second time, studied hard for it, but he was suffering from the flu at the time that he had to take the exam. And he had the same results, the same score, almost identical, no success. So he, le he was working at a, a city government job in Detroit, and he leaves his job to start a business. And it's a struggling business. Uh, it's a selling a, a line of clothing in a dying mall kind of a situation. You, so you can see that he's kind of struggling to maybe find another avenue for himself uh, from the law thing to, well, I'll start this, this retail thing. But then he gets a job assisting in a class action lawsuit against the city of Detroit. So he becomes like a legal assistant. And then he, because of this job he gets, his boss encourages him, why don't you go try for the, the bar exam again? Maybe try it for a third time. And you know what? He passes the bar exam on the third try. Wow, what perseverance. And as a result of that and all that experience, he started his own criminal defense law practice, which he uh, apparently is still engaged in to this day. So what a great story of starting from an, an older 30-ish, mid-30s student working a uh, full-time job, a grueling schedule, nighttime classes, working his way up, failing the bar repeatedly, and now he's a criminal defense attorney. 
What a great story. I really love that. Thanks a lot for sharing that. Okay, so James Lasigno and his piece was written on an Olivetti letter 32. And this was such a sweet piece. This was a sweet birthday poem to his wife. And I can really relate to this. Um, so it's a deep personal accounting of his journey from kind of, you might call it the pit of selfishness and debauchery as a young man, which many of us young men can relate to, to the heights of life now with his wife. And I, he says near the end of the poem, I hear your laugh, and every time you take my hand, I know I cannot get any higher. Isn't that wonderful? She saw the good in him. She saw the climber inside of him. The climber was the person who wants to climb out of that pit of self-centeredness and continue improving himself to be something better. And that is a greatly inspiring piece. I really loved it. And uh, it, it should give everybody hope, if, whether you're in a relationship or not. So great job, James. John Monroe's piece was written on a 1952 Smith Corona Skyrider, which he has uh, given the name Jeep. And it has a green ink ribbon, which is very cool, to match the Jeep color, <laughs> maybe, or the theme. So his piece is called To Climb the Highest Mountain. And this is a dramatic uh, recounting of some high stakes bargaining in the Japanese business world, where he had to go through multiple uh, periods of uh, bargaining sessions with various uh, middlemen, try to get a product marketed, brought to market. But in the end, he had to stick to his principles and not go forward with the, uh, with the bargain, even if it meant losing out on a, on a bunch of money that they really needed at that time. But he stuck to his guns. He stuck to his principles, John did. And the result was later that year securing a much more lucrative deal and in the process making his first million dollars. That is a great story. Of you, you get a little bit of the flavor of what it's like in behind the scenes in that in the intensive Japanese business world and what it takes to succeed and stick into your principles and the reward that comes when you do so. Great job, John. Okay, Kevin Kittle's piece was written on an IBM Correcting Selectric 2. So this might have been the only electric typewriter in. Uh, this particular typing assignment. So his piece is titled Last Hope for Misery. And misery is an acronym. M-M-S-S-R-R-Y stands for Morris Minor Super Sport Rally Racer of Yesteryear. And this is a very adventurous story of uh, him and a partner journeying through Northwest Canada, through the, I guess the Yukon or whatever, in this old car. It's aptly named Misery. And it's already lost an alternator, the windshield's been cracked, and then the head gasket decides to blow. And it's, it's fun, but they, you know what, they make it to this uh, border station at the Yukon Territory and we're able to take in the photo opportunity that results from all the scenery and everything. And we assume that... Uh, the car ends up getting repaired and they continue on their adventures. But I love at the end, a, he says, as we trudged back to misery, a smart for two car, a smart car, glided effortlessly up Highway 37, efficiently turned west on Highway 1 and evaporated into the distance, this new car rubbing, its in, <laughs> rubbing it in the face of the old car that's broken down. There's another, I'm sure there's more to this story we'd like to hear, Kevin, but it was really fun reading it. Thanks a lot. I loved it. Okay, uh, the next piece, this was really fun. The next piece is written by Richard Wood, who goes by the name, the pen name of Antonius Hardcastle. And it turns out that Antonius Hardcastle is the narrator of the story, and he is an ant. And he tells with much originality the, the story of his ant colony and how they have colonized into the broken down part of a rubber factory in Albuquerque on the outskirts of the Albuquerque Downs and Casino. 
<laughs> uh, that was very funny. Um, there are no rubber factories, alas, in that part of town, but uh, <laughs> it's very funny. So uh, I liked, uh, so what happens is his character, Antonius, gets trapped. He falls into a royal HH typewriter. He falls into a typewriter and gets trapped in the typewriter and has to escape. And it's really uh, fun reading his arduous escape. I think he loses one of his legs. He gets caught in the machine as he's struggling to climb out. And he's only able to make the escape because some kid has dropped her hair ribbon or something into the typewriter. And he lives in the typewriter for weeks and subsists on crumbs of food that the kid is dropping into the typewriter. <laughs> that is funny. Um, but I love what he says. He describes his wife when he met her. He says, her long legs and waxy body glinting in the sunlight. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. Yes, erotica for ants. <laughs> Well, Darren Sundstrom's piece um, was written on a Smith Corona Silent Super, and it's a, re a recounting of his most uh, most feared nemesis at the time, which was the Millennium Force, which at the time was the world's tallest and fastest roller coaster. Might still be, for all I know. Uh, this was really fun reading about how he spent that entire weekend waiting, you know, just in trepidation thinking about the roller coaster and having to finally face up to the fact that he was going to have to conquer his fear and write it and i love the great literary reference he uses to moby dick where the coaster is his white whale and he is the ahab <laughs> that was really fun you know i've never really liked roller coasters myself but i can really appreciate uh what it took to, the, to stir up the courage to uh uh, to ride that thing. So great job. And lastly, we have Ira Stone's piece written on a Sears Chevron. And this is a real sobering story. Uh, it's wonderful though. So Ira is a rabbi who serves a uh, synagogue community. And every year in, in um, recognizing the Holocaust to his congregation, he's finding um, trying to find new ways to communicate uh, to his congregation. And he finally decides that this one year, he was going to try this idea called a fast of words, which is a medieval Jewish tradition that comes out of medieval Europe, which is a 24-hour period of silence in, in the community to recognize uh, the uh, horror of, of the Holocaust. And... And so, sadly, though, some people in his community disagreed with this form of remembrance, especially the older people who might have experienced it, because um, they misunderstood his intention and they thought it was uh, trying to silence their history and their memory of what happened. But it served as a powerful form of communication to the younger generations of people in this in his community. And this became a tradition that lasted for several years that they did. And so I really find this was a very wonderful story, I think. Um, and it's very meaningful today in the context of what's going on in the United States in relation to the remembrance of some bad things that have happened in our history that we should never forget uh, these things these uh, things of racism and hate never forget that we have the ability to do this as people and um, it is as he says um, the point of the, the fast of silence was to convey the irrationality of the Holocaust. There was no logic to it. It was irrational. And so this was a great and timely piece, Ira. I really appreciate it and thank you for sharing it. Well, so this was a little struggle for me. I didn't participate in this week's uh, typing assignment just because I, I don't know if I don't really have any mountain I've climbed or if I'm still climbing one or if I don't recognize the ones I've climbed already. I didn't really have a great story to tell that wasn't just mundane. Uh, so anyways, I really appreciate all of the participation we had. And this was a difficult assignment. I realize that. It's hard uh, stepping out of your own perspective and trying to find uh, 
an external view of what your life has been like and then trying to write about it objectively. It's really difficult and you guys all did really well and I hope these typing assignments have become for you uh, as an exercise has kind of helped to strengthen your writerly muscles and exercised you as writers and, and maybe opened up some new avenues of thought that you haven't really considered before. But we're going to go forward with typing assignments again, more and uh, one of my uh, participants has already sent me in request that I made uh, a week or two ago about if you have any new ideas for more different kinds of themes for typing assignments, well, he's already sent me another idea, several of them, and we're going to try one next week that he um, that he suggested. So I'm going to publish in the next couple days, I'll publish uh, the topic for typing assignment eight coming up. But until next time, great job, everybody. I'd love to see this creativity. Thank you for what you've done and continue writing and stay creative and you have yourselves a great day.